Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. We're shooting from the Lugnuts facility. And what we have here is a very interesting car. This is a 1970 Lancia Fulvia 1.3 S. Um, you'll also notice these Zagato badges on the side. So many people refer to this car as a Fulvia Zagato, although that's not the, uh, that's not the manufacturer's name for it. So uh, we will do um, a walk around of the car. We'll go through it. Um, we will do, uh, put it on the hoist. Uh, we've got about uh, 250 photographs, plus the video, which we're gonna use uh, for the um, description and bring a trailer. So this is a preview. Um, Lancia uh, is a very interesting company. Um, long history of mechanical innovation. They've always made beautiful cars. They were always a little bit more expensive um, uh, and had you know, maybe a little bit less power than some of the Alphas and other cars it was compared to. Um, it was really a connoisseur's car, I think, and it has a great competition history, particularly in international rallying, where it won, I think, 70 and 72. Um, but we'll go through everything, and then we'll finish it off with a road test, although we're waiting for some snow to clear in Calgary before we do that. Um, and as part of this uh, Bring a Trailer preview, I thought it was good to introduce the owner of the car, who of course has been immersed in it, you know, since, since he bought it or before, and can really tell you a lot more about it than I can. So we'll introduce Graham Bennett. You wanna come out? And we can talk about the Lancia that you, uh, that you bought. So as I understand it, you went looking for a Fulvia Coupe uh, in the f five or six years ago? Yep, <clears throat> that's how it started out. Um, Every spring they have, uh, Classic Car Adventures has a spring thaw rally. And right. so several years ago I participated in it in another car and there was a Fulvia Coupe participating oh, okay. and I was really struck by uh, how nimble and uh, light it was on its feet. You drove it? Were you uh, driving no, it? no, I just tried to keep up with it. Oh yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> and so um, I decided to start looking around for one of my own and so um, I started poking around on some of the Lancia websites and uh, forum boards, and yep. and it became clear that um, one of the big names in um, Lancia in terms of North American part supply and uh, repair uh, is a facility in Los Angeles, uh, LA Lancia, yep. and um, the fellow who runs that is Aiden Figueroa. So. I contacted him and he indicated that he and an Italian partner um, offered a service where they would source a car in Italy and um, take care of all the paperwork right, get it over uh, here. and get it yep. over here yep. and, uh, and deliver it. So I signed up with them and they, we started looking for a coupe and I guess it would be fair to say I was kind of picky about what I uh, was looking for and after about six months we finally found one that was really really nice and uh, and he was waiting to find a different launcher to buy uh, before he would sell it so months went by and then eventually he decided he was not ever going to find the one he wanted and he was keeping his keep so <laughs> the search started again um, with the trouble I was having finding a coupe, I decided to maybe spend a bit more money and start looking at these sports. Right. No, they made and they made the Berlina, which was the sedan. Yeah. The coupe. Yeah. And then the sports. So there were three model lines on the same platform. Exactly. Similar yeah. to what Alfa Romeo would have done uh, with their GTVs. There was a, a sedan version, a coupe version, and then a racing version, the GTA. Yeah. So similar to, similar to this car. Okay. Yeah. And there was a range of motors within all of those right. different models. Um, so this one came up um, fairly quickly and I was, I was struck by the color <laughs> and yep. uh, the fact that it was um, in nice shape and, and readily available, or at least I thought it was at the time. Um, there's a bit of a long, sad story that goes with that. But yep. um, we eventually made a deal with um, the uh, Italian owner down in Genoa. In Genoa, okay. And uh, uh, that's when we started running into a few bumps. Um, the first bump was um, Aiden's uh, Italian partner did a closer inspection and discovered that the, car, the motor in the car, while a 1.3 liter um, wasn't the 1.3 liter that's supposed to go with a 1.3 S, 
So how many, like, so Lancia, they started this car with a 1.1, then they had a 1.3, one then... Uh, one, they started with a 1.2. 1.2. Then a, a 1.3, and then they ultimately made them uh, with a 1.6. All right, and so, so yeah, okay. So this is a 1.3 S, so. But the S is different from the regular 1.3. It three. is at uh, three more horsepower. That's three more horsepower, okay. So ground pounding 90. Um, so ultimately what we decided to do was um, Giovanni found a motor of the correct type, and right. so um, we knocked a bunch of money off uh, the price of the car, and we had his mechanic refurbish the motor and then drop it in this car, and he took the the other motor in trade and took it away. So what would, like, I mean, why would they have, I mean, they've got the, 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 uh, the, the, the Fulvia sedan coupe and the Sport. Um, through the years, they got different displacement increases. So in 1970, they had uh, the 1.3 S and the 1.3 S Sport, and they only differed by three horsepower. Well, what was the rationale for that, or the reason for that, or how is the engine <laughs> different, or do you have any idea? Um, I, I don't think I could answer that question. Um, okay. yeah, I'm not sure what, you know, it's obviously the same displacement, but I don't know if it's an issue of carburation or, or how they attained uh, all three of those. Okay, powers. so you don't know if this, the head is different or the block is different. Presumably the block's different too then. Eh? Um, well, yeah, I suspect it's likely the head. Um, this is kind of an interesting motor just because it's a, a really narrow anger, <laughs> angle. Um, yeah. V4, yeah. so it's so narrow, it's about a little over 12 degrees that they can use one head um, to cover uh, um, both banks, and uh, so it's a, a twin cam, but, but uh, with a single Looks head like a twin it. cam, but isn't, and it's, and it's funny, because they didn't just pick an angle, like Lancia developed that narrow angle V-series engine, I think from the Lambda in 1922, and continued producing a version of that for 50 years. But it's like each year they change the angle or something. Yeah. <laughs> so one year they're 12 and they went to 14 for this car, 11 for this car. And, and Lancia had always got themselves into trouble with uh, the engineering expense, which was you know, too much for the volume of cars they sold. So it's, it's kind of funny. And, and concurrently with this, they had the Flavia. And that had a flat four engine of not that much different displacement. Eh? So they're, yeah. they're running all these crazy engines. And I think, I, I think I read that they had a Greek version and they made a special version for Greek for taxation re reasons. And I can't remember what the displacement was, but it was in between those. But anyway, yeah. you got the right, the right engine for the Zagato Sport. Exactly. So they put that in and uh, they cleared up some uh, paperwork issues and um, we eventually got it on a boat and um, we, I, I shipped it, I took a deep breath and shipped it uh, roll on, roll off yep. from um, Italy through Bremerhaven and then over to Tacoma. And then uh, sent a truck down to pick it up there and, and eventually bring it back to Calgary. And I noticed you had some instructions in there to start it. Because you have to, you, what do you, turn it and then press it in to start the car? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I had to scatter the thing with uh, instructions because to, to turn it on, for example, you turn the key 180 degrees and then you push the whole assembly in to engage the starter. <laughs> um, but it seems like it wasn't quite enough instructions. Uh, I got a phone call from the truck driver when he arrived at my house in Calgary and said he was there and I, I told him, great, I'll be right there. And to be helpful, he decided he would um, take it out of the trailer for me and uh, followed all those instructions, but didn't realize that it was a manual choke. And so spent the time between phoning me and me arriving there, burning out the starter, um, trying to start it for me <laughs> and get yeah. it out of the trailer. Yeah, but, well, that's but, maybe one of the reasons they didn't uh, uh, sell too many in the North American market was the service. So uh, the service network. So, well, I mean, Lancia had a pretty spotty history in North America. Um, what years could you buy a Lancia in the U.S. and Canada? Not very many, huh? Well, I think um, through to about 19... Well, you could buy a Fulvia, I think, right up till about um, 1972 or so. Okay, so that's when everything got a lot harder with yeah, the emissions. And, and then and as so they on. introduced their, their newer, so um, the Monte Carlos and the Beta and the... So was that car, was, it, was a Monte Carlo ever... For sale, it was for sale in North America, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yes. so, okay. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they and that was in the 70s, right? Yeah, they okay. pressed through, and I think probably as late as 1980, you could have got one. And but, in Calgary, uh, where would you find, where would you buy a Lancia, or or 
pro there probably wasn't know, a dealer. When here. I was here in 1980, the thought never crossed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, most so people probably sure. have, haven't even seen one, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, it, I mean, it's a pretty rare sight in Canada, in Alberta. I mean, do you yeah. know of any other lanches in the area? There are some lanches. Uh, I'm quite sure this is probably the only sport, um, certainly in Western Canada and probably in all of Canada. Um, yeah, okay. But there are a variety of others, including one or two here in Calgary. Most okay. of the people seem to start with a, with a coupe and then, um, then you can go a long way up the food chain in terms of expense. Yeah, well, if you, the, if you, if you think uh, Zagato, well, uh, sky's the limit, isn't it? So Zagato would have started in the 1920s. Uh, they were a, a Crozier, Crozier uh, coach builder. And uh, they would have, I mean, they would have done bodies for, for many manufacturers, but they're principally in the 20s were known for bodying alpha males uh, and particularly racing uh, alpha males. So the, uh, the six Cs, uh, many of them had Zagato bodies and, and they were known for their uh, flared fenders and lightweight. And I think uh, uh, Zagato was, uh, I think this was the last car that Zagato built um, that was actually raced, that, that, that was a competition machine. Yeah, that's, um, that was the origin of this particular model yeah. was for racing, although it didn't, you know, they didn't do it for very long before Lancia introduced their next uh, series and, and they just retired this. So it did a few rallies, um, but... Right. But, they, but, no. but the coupe version of this won the World Rally Championship in 72 and 74, are those uh, dates right? I think that's about right. Yeah, yeah. 72 so for sure. Two years, and then, and then the... And then the Fulvia got replaced by the Stratos. And the, the, the famous rally driver at the time was Minari, right? Yeah, Sandro and he, Minari. Right, and he won in a Fulvia, and then also won in a Stratos. And then after the Stratos, that was the 037, right? Yeah. And that was the last rear wheel drive rally car that uh, Walter Roll uh, won in. So, Lancia has a, a, a really great history of, of innovation, lightweight bodywork. I always thought the double bubble, Abarths and so on, I always thought the double bubble bit was an Abarth invention, but just doing some reading on it, it was Lancia who really used that format. Uh, you know, where the center, not in this car, but in the center, or the, the uh, over the driver's helmet, uh, a bubble for increased headroom. So they would have bodied everything from Ferraris, Alphas, Lanches, um, and they had their signature style, uh, and uh, they can be credited with that uh, double bubble. Of course, they famously did the Aston Martin DB4 GT. They did, right. they did I think, 19 of those, and you'd probably have to pay more than 10 million each for those. Many of those Alpha pre-war cars are five and $10 million cars. So Zagato um, uh, really has a fantastic history. Um, and, they, and they're real survivors. They started, I think, 10 years before Pininfarina, and they weathered the harsh economic times during the war uh, and other times through their history, doing uh, truck cabs and military vehicles, golf carts, all kinds of things to keep in business. And so um, it's certainly a great name. This was the most um, voluminous produced Zagato bodied car. Uh, at around uh, 7,000, is that right? That's about right, amongst the series, yeah. And, and there were three series uh, of car, and uh, the um, first series are easily identifiable by the hood yeah. and the spare tire well, so we and, can... Yeah, and the door, uh, doors as well. The doors, the hood, and the spare tire compartment um, are all aluminum. They're all aluminum. So that yeah. we had the first batch of cars, which were all aluminum, all aluminum, in the entire body. Yeah. And I all read, alloy. I read that uh, Zagato is known for lightweight coach work, and I read that the uh, all aluminum body cars were so light that they weren't durable enough to to uh, compete in the 24-hour races. Somehow that it was just too oh. light a body. Oh. I I don't know where I read that. It is <laughs> yeah, read it. I don't know. But these cars competed in places like. In the U.S., like Sebring, which is a really bumpy track, uh, you know, really tough on cars. But let's let's look at this. And so one of the the signature, I don't know, the signature pieces of the Series One 
fulvia zagato is this uh, side opening hood which throws everybody and then um, you can see the front mounted uh, v4 engine it's inclined 45 degrees or so 45 degrees uh, twin uh, twin solexes and you can see the head here which kind of looks like a twin cam head but isn't it's just because of the narrow angle v4 and wh what happens with these is you have one cylinder here one here one here and one there and so you can take what would be you know uh, the length of a four cylinder uh, and compress it into a more compact shape and that concept was introduced in the Lambda in, 19, in the 1920s. But if you look at a cross section of a Bugatti Veyron engine or any of the VR6 Volkswagen engines, they have very similar V angles and bore spacings. So, and those engines are also really, uh, really compact. Um, so what else have we got going here? Uh, we've got a four speed gearbox. Four speed gearbox. This is that, because it's a series one, it has um, the long lever um, shifter on it, so it's, uh, <laughs> it is indeed a long lever um, shifter. But uh, the series two um, were five speed with a dog leg, but this is just a traditional um, four speed in an H pattern. And what's going on with this? This engine's on a subframe then? It is. And this is a, this is a transverse, um, and I'll flash a picture of that uh, when, I, when I edit the video, but there's a, it's a beautiful aluminum casting, isn't it? Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. It, you can uh, basically lift the body right off these things and leave the motor and the, uh, and the subframe behind. If, if you're gonna work on the motor or redo your subframe, you can just um, lift the body up and, and leave it all in place to work now, on. Can we get a shot of this, uh, of this casting in there? Because, you know, like, Okay, so there's cars in the 60s and 70s that have their engines on subframes, like an E-type Jag is, is an example, but it's a fairly crude tubular steel subframe. So Lancia on a 1.3 liter engine has this beautiful aluminum casting um, with, uh, with strengthening ribs in it to support the engine. And that piece, if I saw that piece alone, I would... I would say that's, you know, that's something out of a, of a modern Porsche or a Bentley or something like that. I mean, it's a, I don't know, I mean, I had an Aston Martin, a DB24, and it had some cast pieces in it from the late 50s. I don't know of another, like certainly you don't see that in an Alpha, you don't see it in a Jag, you don't see it in a Porsche. In that class, you don't see it in a Ferrari, I don't think either. Like it, that is really, I think, unique engineering, and completely over the top for, and you know, I would say, in like a 1.3 liter car. Like it just, it's it's exquisitely engineered, and 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 done in a in a really expensive way, yeah. <laughs> which probably you know ultimately did did the company in. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've got the offset radiator and you've got an oil cooler um, up front there and it has as well. An oil cooler. So how many, like a Porsche 356 doesn't have an oil cooler. I mean, I guess, I guess a 911 does, I suppose. But there's not too many cars built, um, you know, from this era with uh, this kind of technical, um, uh, technical sophistication. And uh, okay, and then so the other, Series one um, differ differentiator is where the spare tires. Right. Uh, yeah, um, that panel um, swings down, and the spare tire and jack and tools um, fit in a compartment that's underneath there, and uh, and sits up a bit. So there's a, a carpeted cover. Um, over right, these. and then we get in here, and then and then explain this feature. Oh yeah, that uh, rear hatch is gives you access to the storage area, but it's electrically controlled, so that from the front of the car you can flick a switch and it raises it up about an inch and a half, and and it makes the airflow through the car. It's just so smooth. It makes it, it makes a difference. Yeah, with the, you know, I've driven you know a thousand or more kilometers with the windows open and that hatch open, and you know it's. Uh, 
There's no buffeting. There's okay, so there's an engineering reason. It's not a not a sales yeah. gimmick. Yeah, no. And yeah, then no. so we can see the the uh, the well for the spare tire here. Why wouldn't they just put the spare tire in the back? Well, I have another panel and a key and a. I guess I guess you keep it. I guess if, I guess you keep uh, the dirt out of the car. Yeah, you're, exactly. You're changing it, I suppose. But uh, you have your fine Italian luggage in there. You don't want your spare tire. <laughs> yes, they have fitted luggage with us. <laughs> Um, I don't have it if they have it. <laughs> and then what's going on with this back seat? Isn't this funny? So is it a back seat or, or um, isn't it? It is not really intended to be a back seat, but um, you know, it, it's shaped as if it were. I mean, there's, there's this bar here which um, it keeps the luggage from sliding forward, and then um, there's this rear bench basically to... Uh, so it's kind of like a contoured parcel shelf that maybe your kids could sit, could sit yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you hate your kids, you put them back there. Okay. And then we've got a front wheel drive car, so we have no, no drive shaft tunnel. And lots of room in the inside, huh? Yeah. Yeah, there is a ton of room. And, you know, those seats are superbly comfortable. Um, you just sit down in them and, and they're... Um, shape. This is this is just vinyl upholstery. It's not leather. Yeah. You could it, get it, leather, it, but, oh, oh, really? uh, oh, you could? but not very many uh, people pop for it because it was very expensive. Yeah, and then and then so this car spent its life in southern Italy. I understand. Yep, that's right. And then it looks like it was always always kind of a rally car. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you know it's. I don't know how many owners it had in its Italian history, but uh, um, it certainly has been well used and. Uh, in all sorts Enjoy. of uh, rallies and uh, and now we're we're in we're in Calgary, Alberta, and uh, you know anywhere is a long way away from here. <laughs> and and where have you taken this car? Since, and you've you've had it since about 2015, right? Um, the search started in 2015. Um, it finally showed up on Canada's shores in February 2017. Oh, okay. Um, so. I took it in the in the spring thaw rally that uh, Classic Car Adventures um, puts on every year, and so um, I drove it from Calgary to the start po point on the West Coast, which is about thousand kilometers or so, and then the spring thaw is five or six hundred kilometers a day over the course of three days, and then I um, drove it back to Calgary via Vancouver Island, so. Another twelve or thirteen hundred kilometers. So uh, it uh, sounds like what four thousand kilometers. Is yeah, about? that's about right. And any incidents? Um, none. It just uh, it went really well. Um, you went four thousand kilometers in a forty-five-year-old <laughs> Italian car. Yeah, and, and uh, on the highway, and nothing broke. No, and it you know it's such <laughs> a smooth motor. Um, I was, after the end of the spring thaw, I was running late to catch the ferry that I'd booked to, the, to Vancouver Island. So um, I was driving what passes for fast in this car. And, you know, I drove for about two hours straight at about 5,500 RPM and um, didn't miss a beat, didn't heat up, um, just wow. really smooth. Um, okay, so how many kilometers in total do you think you've put on it since 2017? I probably put, well, probably not much more than 6,000, 6,500 probably. And most of that in the one trip. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. then I've just used it in and around town here uh, since then. Okay, and then what, uh, what maintenance have you done to it? Uh, just, we, we can put that in the, in the listing, but generally speaking, you just tune, just, just tune ups for them, really? Uh, yeah, uh, that's about it. I mean, in terms of things getting it ready to go in the rally, for example, I... Uh, I put three-point seat belts in it, and um, you know, added a bit of sa safety to it. But uh, other than that, you I mean, haven't used the fire extinguisher. No, no it's fires. Good. And uh, other than that, you know, it's just been you know, I, I cleaned up the interior. There had been um, over the course of the years some warpage in the interior panel, so I put new door cards and 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 cards in all the panels all the way back and. Uh, I put that new starter in it and uh, and a few things like that. But, uh, but other than that, you know, it came um, as a really nice car and uh, pretty much ready to go. And if you, you know, when you, you you know, goes to the next owner um, and, uh, and he or she takes delivery of it and starts to want to use it, what kinds of things do you think might be coming up? What, does it any, 
deferred maintenance that you can think of, anything that you might have were thinking of doing but haven't done? Um, well, mechanically, I don't think there's anything. I've just, um, this year, given it a, a complete tune-up, so new plugs, new uh, distributor cap, new spark plug leads, um, new rotor, new condenser. Um, so, you know, mechanically, there's nothing. There's a new battery in it. Um, the oil's just been changed, oil and filter, and it comes with some extra filters and a bunch of other um, things. You know, if I were to keep this and plan another longer rally, um, I might do the, the front end. You know, I, I, I had them include um, ball joints and um, a tie rod and tie rod ends for the front end. Um, I didn't need it at the time, but I just thought if they're shipping a the car, I might as well put some stuff in it. Yeah, um, sure. So those will come with the car, and you know, it might be time to put those in. Still drives. We don't know. You know straight we, as an arrow. We don't have any abnormal tire wear or any other sign. No. That, yeah, yeah, okay. No. Okay. Yeah, the tires are fresh, so no tires required. So it, you know, it's ready to go, really. Okay. Well, um, you know, it's a lovely thing. We're going to do a driving video uh, of it as well, uh, and I think it's really interesting that. Um, this car, for whatever reason, just attracts, you know, a real uh, enthusiastic, but also, uh, well, I'll, I'll say a real kind of sophisticated gearhead. <laughs> yeah. Take that as a compliment. For instance, uh, we all watch Jay Leno's Garage, and uh, on Jay Leno's Garage, Donald Osborne, who's an appraiser and writer for Sports Car Market, had one of these cars, and I think it went on bring a trailer. Um, there's an English guy, Harry Metcalf, who now has Harry's Garage. Yeah. So it's kind of a, right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, similar to Jay, Le or sorry, yeah, Harry's Garage, uh, similar to Jay Leno's Garage, and he is restoring one uh, as well. And uh, for some reason, it well, for uh, not some reason, the, the reasons we've talked about, the uh, the you know the the, the car real really appeals. Uh, you know, to you know, to to guys who have a deep interest in 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 rallying, in racing, in automobile technology, and uh, you know, history of uh, of competition cars. So, um, I think it's a really neat piece, uh, and yeah. I'm very pleased to have it here. And hope you enjoy the rest of the video. And uh, it'll be on Bring a Trailer in, in due course, and it'll uh, we'll find the, the next owner for it. So. Thank you. Thank All you right. for coming. Thanks, Lawrence.